Um, hemodynamic monitoring is not the focus of my interest, and especially because my ICU in Slovenia is now as the most conservative ICU regarding in, in invasive hemodynamic monitoring. So it'll be a, it was a hard time for me. Um, but I'll, I'll start at the beginning. Um, hemodynamic monitoring is actually a continuous measurement of, of different physiological parameters to guide our management. So without any therapeutic interventions, of course, the monitoring doesn't do anything. Not just to intervene, but also we have to keep in mind that we have to assess our treatment. So we have to come back again after, after such an intervention and see what our monitors show. Otherwise, there is no need for hemodynamic monitoring. And what Michael Pinsky already said almost 20 years ago, there is, of course, no improvement in survival by just using monitor, even if it's advanced, if it's not linked with, with treatment approaches um, that are important um, for the outcome. Um, but by talking about um, advanced hemodynamic monitoring, there is an artificial line between basic and advanced. We know that in at the words basic uh, monitoring is, usu is usually intermittent temperature, ECG and so on. But of course, more advanced monitoring uses more advanced, or in our head, advanced numbers, advanced um, uh, things that are maybe more difficult or more complex to measure, and of course, more complex to interpret, because it's very, diff it's very simple to say this patient has elevated body temperature or not, but it's much more uh, difficult to interpret wh whether, whether the fluid status of the, of the patient is. And of course, advanced monitoring is usually more invasive and usually more complex to measure, and I said also to interpret. So how do we decide in each patient what to use is also a complex decision. We have to weigh actually whether we want to be invasive or non-invasive and so on. But it's actually a very simple decision at the beginning because in very healthy patients without any chronic diseases or without any high risk, and if the acute disease um, or the acute procedure we're doing in, in the OR is not, um, is not uh, very high risk, then of course we're satisfied with non-invasive intermittent measurements. But as soon as these things increase, we have to go even for advanced invasive continuous um, hemodynamic monitoring in our patients. And ideally advanced monitoring would, would measure pressure, not just continuous, continuously measure pressure, also it measures flow and again, the numbers of the flow are not important, but its sufficiency is important. Um, and if, and it, it has to measure also some filling indicators of volume re responsiveness in our patients. Um, and of course, it's better if it, if it continues than intermittent, because we can see every second what is going on with our patient. But then at the end, we're stuck with, with a pile of monitors and we don't know which to choose in, in each patient. So here, there is no recipe saying this one is the best or this one is the worst or you need this one for this patient. It's also a very complex decision. If you look at the provider's websites, you can see different tables where they show you how your non-invasive monitors, what they do, what minimally invasive monitors measure, invasive monitors, and you can then decide, okay, I need this, I need that. But it's also a complex procedure. Um, and by reading the review articles, we also know uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of every, every monitor. Some are, have to be calibrated, some not, some have um, the direct measurements, some have calculated measurements and so on. But again, it's quite difficult to come through such a big table and decide what is best for, for our patient. There's a nice review paper published this year by Michael Pinsky saying that it should, it should be a stepwise approach to how to choose a, a, a right um, hemodynamic monitoring. And of course, it has to be a process-specific monitor. And we have to sometimes, we have to know our patients because we have our patients in different cardiovascular states. And like Susanna said, we have to use our monitors to identify the, the compensation early, not when there's already a full-blown shock in our patient. Um, and we need this, of course, to guide our fluid resuscitation, our anotropic or vasopressor therapy in our patients, or even mechanical uh, circulatory support if we're talking about cardiac intensive care unit. Um, and in simple patients, it's quite simple. Let's say we all measure 
or um, we all monitor ECG in our acute coronary um, syndrome patients because we ex we s expect the arrhythmias to be to be there in the first 24 hours, um, and we do measure uh, oxygen saturation in patients with pneumonia in the ER and so on because we know that that the oxygenation might occur. But in more complex patients, we are not that sure what to measure, and especially. To, to, to know in what, in, in, in what cardiovascular state our patient is, it's quite dif difficult. This is a, a study from seven years ago showing that we're not very good at it. This graph shows the proportion of patients receiving fluid after the fluid challenge was already done. And see, even in, of course, in fluid positive responders, the around 50% of patients again got some fluid, but even in, in fluid non-responders, the same proportion of patients was given fluid. So um, we are not very good in differentiating different cardiovascular states. So that's why this is a, a, a chart from transpulmonary thermal thermal dilution, published probably 20 years ago. We sometimes do have to have uh, flow charts to tell us and maybe even younger and, and less experienced physicians what to do when you measure something because you, if you just measure something and you, you don't know what to do then you won't do good. Um, and what's the evidence? Does advanced monitoring benefit our patients? We come from cardiac intensive care units but on purposely I chose perioperative ICU data showing that we know that let's say in this trial uh, poise 2 trial that if patients after surgery go into the into the hypotension that increases 30 day mortality but using advanced monitoring didn't help in survival and also if we, if we look at the optimized trial a big trial with 730 patients going um, going abdominal surgery even by advanced hemodynamic monitoring and optimizing cardiac output, the endpoint was just the same. The only thing they were able to show is one of the secondary endpoints by optimizing cardiac output, the proportion of patients getting an infection after surgery or surgery was a bit less. So they're trying to do this the second trial now, showing with some modifications if we can if we can get some more data. Um, I'll also show you the history, what we do in our ICU. Um, this is a photo of the, of the founder of our, our ICU, Professor Horvat in 1973. He was a fellow in Cedar sinai with Jeremy Swan and William Gans just a year after they invented the PA catheter. So in 1973 we started using PA catheter also in Ljubljana. So we already have almost 50 years of experience. And this is Marco who is today with us here, um, uh, also uh, working in Cedar sinai with, with Jeremy Swan and, and Dr. Gans. So that leaves me the only one who hasn't worked with them. Um, and you'll see the decline in the PA catheter use. So maybe it's my fault of not being there uh, at the right time and at the right place. Uh, but the PA catheter, of course, in the last 50 years, it has, uh, it, has, it has taught us the classical principles of hemodynamic, if I would say. So if you have a hypovolemic patient, you, you know what your indexes will be. And of course, you will consider fluid challenge and so on in patients in cardiogenic shock or cardiogenic cause of the hypertension. You also uh, consider what to do and so on. Um, and we all know what are the advantages of, of the PA catheter, that it, it gives us a good insight into the patient's hemodynamic, but we are also aware of its disadvantages, that it's costly, invasive, and so on, that, and that we have data that show that, of course, mortality is not reduced. Um, the conclusion of one of those papers was that actually the, um, the, uh, the lack is, of course, unclear, and that the PA catheter might even increase the mortality. Well, probably we're all convinced that that's not true, but even if we see the studies that were done, that, that were done later in 2013, this, uh, this meta-analysis um, taking into account 13 randomized trials, again, no difference in mortality. There was, of course, more, more vasodilators than iotropes used in the pulmonary artery catheter, but again, it didn't show any benefit in, in our patients. So the data that this catheter helps in our patient survival is, of course, very low. And these are the numbers from, from our institution. 
on average, we treat around 800 critically ill patients per year, and among them are, of course, patients with shock, around 150 patients annually with septic shock, 80 patients with cardiogenic shock, and 60 patients with hypovolemic shock. Um, you can see that they increased, these are absolute numbers. So we started implanting PA catheters in 1973, and in 1994 we reached the highest number, which is around 10% of patients receiving the PA catheter. But then, of course, after the publications, a, a severe drop in, it, in, in its use. We still do use PA catheter, but rarely. You can see only 10 patients per year in the last few years. Um, we also started using some other advanced monitoring, like Pico catheter in two 2004, and then the, it, it, its use increased, but again, after getting some experience, it, its use decreased very dramatically. So you will ask me, do you monitor your patient or you just use intermittent blood pressure and so on? Now, of course, we do monitor our, pa our patients, um, and I think one of the reasons why we see this big drop in the PA catheter and other catheter use is the echocardiography. If you look at the, the data from 1982, in our IC only 5% of patients had an echo done. But then we used echo as a bedside tool also since 1988, and it, it, its use increased dramatically. So nowadays, especially if we see this cohort with the shock there is almost no patient that goes out from our ICU by not having an echo done, not just the heart, also the lungs and so on. And we use echo not just to, to assess the patient hemodynamically when, when the patient is, admit, as a, is admitted, but we use echo also as an intermittent advanced hemodynamic monitor by coming and checking few parameters and modifying the therapy. So it's not just a diagnostic tool, but also an intermittent hemodynamic monitor. Because if, if I would ask you, you would have a patient that has a PA catheter, and we measure equal LVDP. Which patient has a higher preload? Because we all know that preload is also dependent on LV diameter and LV thickness. So it, PA catheter does not give us all the information that we need in our patients. So also echo has some pros and, 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 and the bedside, uh, it's non-invasive, fast reliable and so on. It, it's no, no point of, of showing all this. And of course in the ICU there are drawbacks. You have sometimes bad transthoracic echo windows, so you have to do the TOE and so on, especially in mechanical ventilated patient. It, it, it is an intermittent technique, so you have to come back again and again and again to do the measurements. It's not just the nurse who calls you, the cardiac output fell, do something. You have to come there and measure to know it, so this is, um, this is not very good. Sometimes it is difficult to interpret and we don't get the standard hemodynamic parameters that the PA catheter taught us. So we have to keep in mind a bit of the mind shift. But ECHO allows us also some newer techniques that maybe we're going to use in the future. I, I want to just mention in short like ventricular uh, arterial coupling where we can use an echo and arterial line to calculate it because our heart and the arterial system are interconnected and if we, have to, if we want to evaluate better the hemodynamic state of our patient and of course the cardiovascular performance, this might be one of the tools. It's quite easy to, to calculate it. You know that arterial elastance, what the definition is, um, and, and which parameters you have to measure to calculate it and also what the normal numbers are because we do have the data that show us that patients in shock do have worse ventricular arterial coupling or the numbers are higher and even in survivors and non-survivors there are differences. We still don't know whether we, if we try to, to focus on these numbers and to, to bring them into a normal range if this helps our patient or not, um, but we'll see that in the future. And also, let's say that Levosimedan in ischemic cardiomyopathy improved the ventricular arterial coupling. So all these things can be also calculated just by using echo and the arterial line. We also do assess fluid responsiveness in our ICU. It's an old method. See, one of the best is pulse pressure variation. Why do we do that? Of course, we have to keep in mind that by optimizing the volume state or optimizing the preload, we get better stroke volume 
by re increasing only a little bit of the myocardial oxygen consumption compared to anotropic support or, or and any, everything else. So in, in the first place we have to optimize the preload of our patients. It's very easy to done, you can calculate it by uh, by hand, but now we have also monitors, of course, that do that, do that instead of us. It's not just the pulse pressure variation, you can also use stroke volume variation or systolic pressure variation to assess preload responsive, but keep in mind that graph that sometimes you have to give the patient fluid, but, and sometimes you also have to stop it. No, don't just measure and do. Uh, what is a drawback I checked? Last year, in 2021, we had 21% of patients in atrial fibrillation in our ICU. Not in chronic one, but at least some paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So, of course, in these patients, these old methods are useless and we have to think of something else. Biochemical markers are, are of course, good. I won't talk about the measurement of the venous uh, blood saturation and so on. Serum lactate measurements is beneficial because we do get less organ dysfunction if we target lower lactate. But we have to keep in mind that if we want to normalize the lactate, we often overload our patients with the fluid. So one of the what um, one of the things that that are that are suggested is that once the lactate, that this decrease in lactate starts to, or the slope starts to decrease, and if we, have, if we have other flow responsive variables normal, that we have to stop the infusion also, not to, to, to infuse the patient until the lactate normalizes. So, which monitor to choose in our patient is of course important, but keeping in mind that it's not the monitor that will help the patient. What we also need to, need to understand is that it's usually the ICU nurse that observes the monitor and calls us, so without a proper protocol when to call us or when to intervene, nothing will be better. And also, once we are alerted, we have to be aware that we have to know the physiology behind and we have to have some some local protocols what to do when we measure something different so the interventions because it is quite complex here i'm pretty sure that if we would put ourselves arterial line in the evening and go to bed and we'd continuously measure our blood pressure and we we would call one of the younger um, physicians to observe us, some of us would wake with norepinephrine infusion. Um, so, do we overtreat patients if we do measurements? Maybe. Of course, sometimes it can be increased workload for our nurses. So, we, I, don't, I don't know the ICU where you wouldn't have problem or where we wouldn't have problems with ICU nurses. So, do we really, really need to increase their workload by sticking more and more catheters and writing down more and more numbers and calling us every minute and so on? I don't know. And of course there are other issues like alarm fatigue and so on that are connected with advanced hemodynamic monitor. Um, so even by looking the, the the guidelines regarding monitor, they're quite old to, from 2014, but I think this year, at the beginning of next year, new guidelines are coming out. What do we have regarding data? We have the early assessment in shock, echo, class of recommendation, one level of evidence B, that's why it's bold. Um, we only have level of evidence C, if no response to initial treatment, then we have to continuously, or we should continuously monitor the cardiac output, although we don't have data showing this, that that improves the patient's outcome. We know that we shouldn't routinely use PA catheter in all the patients, but we still know how to select those ones that where we need them. Um, that maybe it's a bit better in the right ventricular shock. Um, the transpulmonary thermodilution it's also quite low level of evidence. We do have better data. The dynamic variables versus the static ones are better to assess volume responsiveness, also bold. So we're quite only three major recommendations till now. Um, Serial lactate also just a, a recommendation by the experts, not having strong evidence behind or studies. Um, and that we know that we shouldn't use inotropes um, if in patients with heart failure 
even if the EF is reduced, but the flow is adequate. Um, and we, we shouldn't target any normal numbers of, of um, DL2, that we have to assess the whole patient and, and uh, see what we have. So guidelines don't help us with cho choosing the perfect advanced hemodynamic monitor of our patients. So one of the things I also look forward, maybe there will be someone smarter than us in the near future that will help us to decide what to measure and what to do with these measurements. So to conclude, this is what happens if a cardiologist works in the forest. So my take home message number one is um, use those monitors that you know how to use. When you change so the different monitors change also your, your algorithms, what to do when you measure something. And of course, the second take home message in, in the patients that are almost dead, there is no benefit of, of the advanced hemodynamic monitor, as it also is not putting arterial line when you go to bed. So I think there is an indication for, for advanced, especially invasive monitoring nowadays. But just for the discussion, I will finish. What if? Thank you.